Hi there. We welcome you to worship with First Christian Church in Coralville, Iowa. We're really glad that you're here today and hope that our time together will be meaningful for you. So if you are new to us, we would invite you to visit our website, icdisciples.org. There's lots of information there and you can learn more about who we are. And there's also a way for us to connect. There is a connection card there on the homepage. If you click that button, there's a form to fill out that gets sent to us and it will give us a chance to respond to you and get to know you. And certainly if you are in the local area, there are a lot of other ways we can connect as well. And we would look forward to that. As we get ready to worship, a couple of things that I always invite you to gather. One is that if lighting a candle is a meaningful act for you, then I would invite you to gather a candle at this time. We also will take communion together later in our worship service. So gather the elements you will receive for communion. It might be something traditional like bread and juice or wine but it can really be anything. Whatever a common food and drink from your kitchen is, that's appropriate here. So pause if you need to, go gather those things, and then rejoin us as we enter into worship. As we come to worship, the first act that we share together is the act of lighting a candle. We do this each time we gather as a reminder of the divine presence always with us. And now let's sing together. The opening hymn that we're singing is, Who is my mother? Who is my brother? The words will be on your screen, so please sing along. Let's worship God together. As we come to this time of prayer, I invite you to settle in, to take a deep breath, to center yourself in the presence of God. Let us pray together. God of resurrection, again, we pause in the newness of this day and we embrace the possibilities. Because if we're paying attention, you remind us again and again that resurrection is possible, that new life is happening all around us, that we are invited to not only witness it or participate in it, but even to help create it. 
So we ask you to root us so deeply in new life that when we find ourselves surrounded by conflict, we can resurrect peace. When we see that all the reactions around us are rooted in fear, we can resurrect love. When the stark and difficult realities of the world overwhelm us, we can resurrect hope. God, there is much in this world that is not rooted in you, and sometimes we don't know what to do in the face of that reality. We don't know how to change things or even sometimes what to change. We sometimes struggle to see a better way. And yet you call us to be Easter people, to live with the conviction that there is another way and to live with the commitment to choose the ways of compassion and love, of generosity and welcome. So we ask for your guidance, for your wisdom, for your strength, for your companionship, that our lives may reflect your heart and that in our living, others may see you. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who we follow. Amen. I wonder if you've ever heard that people are made in the image of God. You know, when I hear that, it makes me think, well, gosh, I was made in the image of God. So when I look in the mirror, that I must like look a little bit like God. And if I look a little bit like God, well, then when you look in the mirror, you look a little bit like God too. And when people all over the world look in the mirror, they all look a little bit like God. It's kind of amazing to think of that, to think that all people everywhere can look like God all at the same time. All people of all ages and sizes, of all skin color and hair colors, of all eye colors, of all abilities, um, we all look a little bit like God. So it's kind of interesting that we often hear God, or probably most often hear God, referred to using he and him pronouns. And, um, and I guess I wanted us to think beyond that today. Um, so I am going to share with you a book that a new book that has come out that is wonderful. Um, this book is called Mother God. And so we are going to to read this together. And I hope that it will help all of us to expand our minds and our hearts to embrace just how amazing um, God is and how we really can't um, really can't just put one image or one gender or one size or one skin color on God, because God is all of us. So let's share in this book together. Mother God by Teresa Kim Pesanovsky, illustrated by Koa Lee. And we are sharing this with permission of the publisher, Beaming Books. Mother God. You know God the Father, but God is your mother too. You are made in her image. She is making all things new. Waiting for new life to begin, God is a mother in labor. She takes deep breaths until the birth, rejoicing with friend and neighbor. Throughout the day and night, God wakes to nurse the infant at her side. She snuggles her baby gently until he closes his eyes. When baby tumbles on the floor, God pulls off each tiny sock. She holds her arms out wide, and the baby learns to walk. God is Sophia Wisdom, teaching what is true and right. Wisdom works, creates, 
orders and plays. She calls us with joy and delight. Over the waters of creation, God is the spirit who hovers. She forms the earth into a bed and the wide sky its covers. God is a mother hen who gathers chicks under her wings. She plays hide and seek in soft grass behind trees and quiet springs. She protects her cubs from danger. God, the great mother bear, as fierce as she is tender, she guards them in her care. God is a lurking leopard, secretive, skilled, and strong. Teaching her young to swim and climb, she roars and they tag along. With a huge supply of flour, God kneads and bakes good bread. She feeds her entire neighborhood. They feast and all are fed. God is a skillful seamstress who stitches and sews thread together. She makes clothes for rain, snow, and sun, caring for you in all kinds of weather. Granny, Baba, Hai Mioni, God is a woman with gray hair. She passes down stories of old, rocking softly in a chair. She is the God who sees you. God weeps, mourns, and cries. She comforts you through the longest night, keeping watch until sunrise. She quiets us with her songs, singing lullabies in the night. God, our nurturing mother, wraps us in holy moonlight. God is your loving mother. You are made in her image too. God calls you beloved. She is making all things new. I hope that you enjoyed this book just as much as I do. And, um, and I hope that uh, some of those, those images and those ideas, which are all based on things that we read in the Bible, um, that some of those will stick with you and they'll, they'll help us to consider um, just how big and how amazing God is. So please pray with me. God, you are amazing simply amazing that you can be like all of us and that all of us can be like you. God, help us to remember that all people are your people and that you love all people. And God, help us just to remember to look for you everywhere, to see you in every face we meet. And God, help us to love each other, to love ourselves, and to love you. Amen. Today we hear one of the stories of a post-resurrection encounter between Jesus and the disciples. We are reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. Let us listen for a word from God. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in, because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. 
When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net to shore, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. May God's blessing be added to our hearing of this word. Seminary professor Lisa Davison wrote, The audacity of proclaiming a message of resurrection in a world full of death, a message of hope in a world full of suffering and despair. Who do we think we are? What gives us such boldness? It's absurd. Why would the world listen? The power of the story really is not about something that may or may not have happened 2,000 years ago. Rather, it is the challenge for us to find ways we can work for the resurrection of love in the world right now. It's one thing to believe in a resurrection, but it's something else to live a resurrected life. It seems to me that Peter and the other disciples might have been learning this very thing about which Dr. Davison speaks. Here they were. Based on the information we hear in the Gospel of John, it was at least a week after the resurrection, likely longer, especially since their location had changed. They were no longer in Jerusalem, but now in Galilee. An exact timeline isn't given, and we aren't told exactly why these seven are together. We don't know what they're doing. Maybe they continue to talk about everything they had experienced, everything that had just happened. Maybe they continued to seek to understand. Maybe they just sat together in that silence shared by people who know each other well and who have been through the same experiences. A silence 
that doesn't have to be filled with words. We're not sure what they're doing when this scene opens, but it is Peter who we first hear speak. I am going fishing, he says. After all, he was a fisherman. So maybe that was just his instinct. Maybe fishing was where he felt most comfortable. Maybe it was something that could bring him peace. Or maybe, maybe after three years of traipsing around the countryside with an itinerant preacher who ended up dying on a cross, maybe he decided to return to fishing as a profession. Maybe he didn't know how to continue on without Jesus leading them. Maybe he had simply resigned himself to going back to life as he knew it before. Or maybe he was just hungry and he knew that others were as well. I am going fishing, he said and the others decided to join him. So out they went, loaded up in the boat with all they needed, including nets full of expectation. And yet by morning, they had caught nothing. Now, I don't know about you, but my childhood memories of fishing with my uncle tell me that sometimes you fish and you simply don't catch anything. Here they were. It was morning. They had fished all night. Their nets remained empty, perhaps a haunting reflection of how their lives felt. Then suddenly a voice came from the shore. Why don't you try the right side of the boat? Throw the net in over there. Now remember, John tells us they didn't know who was speaking to them, so they could have easily ignored that shoreline coach. But meanwhile, what did they have to lose? They threw their nets in, and we are told they caught so many fish, they couldn't even pull them back into the boat. And there... In that moment, in that abundance, they recognized Jesus. As quickly as they could, they returned to shore. Jesus was already there preparing breakfast for them, but he asked them to bring some of their catch to the feast as well. And together they sat on the edge of the water having recognized Jesus in abundance and again at the table, even this makeshift picnic table. Then at some point, after they had finished eating, Jesus turned to Peter and they shared a conversation. Do you love me? Jesus asked. Yes, I love you. Feed my lambs. Do you love me? He asked again. Of course I love you. Tend my sheep. Do you love me? The question came a third time. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. And much has been made about this conversation. We can't help but notice the parallel as Peter, having denied Jesus three times, now has the opportunity to proclaim his love not once, not twice, but three times. We can't help but notice this as a moment also of transition. As Peter once declared the one upon whom the church would be built steps into a new kind of leadership. But there's something else we don't want to miss. 
See, while Matthew, in his gospel, gives us a clear commissioning, saying, go therefore and make disciples, perhaps this passage in the gospel of John should be read the same way, as a commissioning, as a reminder to the disciples of what they are about. After all, here in this story, Jesus shows up and provides abundantly for his disciples. But that is not where the story ends. Rather, in the recognition of him and in the midst of their experience of abundance, they are called to go and to care for others. They are called to share the food they have. They are called to tend to the needs, not only the physical hunger, but all of the needs of others of God's children. They are commissioned to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. And the same calling remains for us. If we think that our faith is about what we get, then it is time to reorient ourselves. If we think that resurrection is only something Jesus did years ago in order that we can benefit, then it is time to rethink our understanding. As Dr. Lisa Davison wrote, It is the challenge for us to find ways we can work for the resurrection of love in the world right now. It's one thing to believe in a resurrection, but it's something else to live a resurrected life. See, that's really what our commissioning Our calling, our living as the hands and feet of Jesus is all about. It is about living the resurrected life. Friends, we are invited to recognize Jesus in the many ways and places where he shows up. We are invited to feast on the abundance which he offers And yet neither of these experiences is only about us or what we get from it. Rather, the presence and the abundance of the divine sustain us in order that we can answer the call to go and make a difference in the world, to live a resurrected life, and in doing so, to work for the resurrection of love in our world right now. In recent weeks, Kara and I have been meeting with our young people who are considering baptism. Next week in worship, we will stand in witness and support of a couple who bring their child to be dedicated. Perhaps in these rituals, this commitment we make is more obvious. The commitment of offering care and nurture, of answering God's call to be the presence of Jesus in the world with and for others. But friends, this is not just a calling for special occasions or a calling in the face of seeing young people raised in faith, but it is our calling in our everyday lives. This is not just our calling in response to new life or newly proclaimed faith, but it is our calling in all that we do to share what we have, to care for those we encounter, and to resurrect love in this world. What would the world look like if this were how we lived? What could the world look like if we took seriously this commission first granted to Peter, but to us as well. 
What will the world look like when in all things we bring love? What can the world look like? When we live as people who are meant to care for others, when we not only celebrate resurrection, but when we live the resurrected life. Friends, when we embrace the resurrected life, then together we can dream and together we can make a difference. May it be so. We proclaim the resurrected Christ. As his disciples, we seek to live that resurrection to be the hands, feet, and body of Jesus in and for our world. Jesus said to Peter, follow me. In the same way, Jesus calls us to give our time, our resources, ourselves, to bring love and hope to all of God's children. We are grateful for each of you, and we thank you for the many ways that you support First Christian Church and the ministries that happen at and through us. Your financial offerings may be shared by mailing a check to the address on the screen or by using the donate button on the website. May we give generously and with great joy. prepare for communion, please gather whatever food and drink you will receive today. Today we remembered a breakfast on the beach, a special meeting between the risen Jesus and his disciples. The disciples did not recognize him at first, but then all of a sudden they got it. This man calling to them from the beach, he indeed was Jesus. Jesus had bread, and he was preparing a fire to cook fish. He invi invited the disciples to bring their catch and to join him for breakfast. He served them. They all ate. That breakfast on the beach is not so different from when we gather here around the communion table. Because it is here that we come to meet Jesus, we may not recognize him at first, but he is here and he is waiting for you. And while he prepares the table for each of us, he asks us 
to bring what we have. Because this life is a partnership, a covenant between people and God. So as we gather here today, let us bring what we have to share. And may we bring an open and willing heart to love. May we feast with Jesus as we make plans for how together we will share God's love with the world. It is at this table where we remember another special meal that Jesus shared with those who were closest to him. When he took bread, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to each one there. And he said to them, this is my body given for you. When we eat of the bread, we offer our bodies to the work of God in our world. And then after supper, Jesus took the cup, blessed it and said, this cup represents a new covenant of love for you. And as we drink from the cup, we affirm our desire for God's loving spirit to flow through us. I invite you now to join in this meal. Please pray with me. God of abundance, here we gather at a table where there is always enough. Not only enough, but some left over. Thank you for sharing your abundance with us. And remind us that it is not only about what we receive, but also what we share and do for others. So send us from this table nourished by your bread and cup, ready to care for each of your children who we encounter. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to love. Amen.
till your love's revealing light <clears throat> in its heightened depth of greatness dawns upon our quickened sight making known the aids and burdens your compassion bids us bear stirring us to tireless striving by worship to your service forth in your dear name we go to the child the youth the aged love in living deeds to show hope and health good will and comfort counsel lead and peace we give that your service Friends, it is one thing to believe in a resurrection. It is another to live a resurrected life. Let us go forth ready to live in ways that help bring about the resurrection of love, of compassion, and of generosity in our world. Amen. <laughs>